And the clear out is decent for the men in blue. Well, Russell, oh, it works now, Hugh Jones in the open, and Hugh Jones is alone, looking for Seymour, Hugh Jones goes himself, Johnny May gets to him, but Scotland suddenly into the... Rugby has powerful players, rugby has fast players, some are agile, some are big, some are big, powerful and agile, and some are big, powerful and not agile. A rugby team requires a diverse portfolio of players, all turning themselves into both an offensive and defensive weapon for the team to use in a variety of situations. It's as if someone designed a game that needs players of all possible body shapes. As if someone thought it would be an excellent idea to create a game that forces people with different skills and talents to work together to achieve success. It's one of the idiosyncrasies of rugby, which rugby nerds like me love romanticizing. Some of you have heard me describe rugby as a game of chess, played at high velocity, with the positions making up the different chess pieces and the coach being our chess master. But this rugby romantic also likes to think of it as a symphony orchestra. And for all the instruments and the musicians to create perfect harmony, they need a conductor they need someone that unlocks the best from all the instruments at the team's disposal. You probably already know where this analogy is going. The team is the orchestra, the coach writes the music, and the fly-off conducts the masterpiece. Whether it's directing the forwards to carry the ball upfield to lay a platform, or use the powerful inside centre position to get the ball over the advantage line, because the defence is set. The core functional purpose of the fly-off is to make sure the ball ends up in the hands of the right players at the right time in the right areas of the field. If you understand American football, then the fly-off is rugby's answer to the quarterback. Only a fly-off can play defense, a fly-off can kick, a fly-off can pass. A fly-off needs to have a good rugby brain. While most of the team is concentrating on executing the current phase of play, they are already orchestrating the setup for the next one. The fly-off is positioned in the first receiver position, meaning they are the first backline player to receive the ball from the scrum half in most situations. This is a pivotal position because it is the fly-off's decision and action that sets the direction of the entire team's next phase of play. So when you hear someone refer to the pivot of the team, they are talking about the fly-off. A good rugby team comprehends that one of the most powerful things a team can have is all 15 players operating with a clear understanding as well as everyone being on the same page. And this is achieved by having a clear game plan. And the cornerstone to a game plan is what the team does on a different parts of the field. So the biggest factor that affects the fly of decisions and actions during a match is where they are on the field. Yes, Opposition's positioning and actions on defence, the scoreline, the match situation, all contribute towards what the fly-off decides to do. But no decision or action is taken by the fly-off without at least paying respect to where they are on the field, whether consciously or subconsciously. Even when they decide to run the ball from deep instead of doing a clearance kick, they would not do so without giving their territorial disadvantage some consideration. Generally speaking, the closer the team is to their own try line, the more likely they are to play it safe and kick for territory. And the closer they are to the opponent's try line, the more likely they are to play offensively. But the fly-off still needs to decide how the team is to go about it. For example, if the team is in possession of the ball near their own try line, the fly-off needs to read the situation, then decide if they want to clear the ball straight from the set piece or if they will utilize a ball carrier or a pod of players to carry the ball upfield first.
in order to create more space or provide them with a better kicking angle. When they are in a part of the field where they feel comfortable playing more offensively, the fly half will begin orchestrating the breakdown of the opponent's defence, typically by using siege weapons first to weaken resistance. This is achieved by using powerful ball carriers or pods of forwards to land blows to the defensive line. To get over the gain line and suck in as many defenders as possible. The gain line is also called the advantage line and this is an imaginary line drawn down the middle of a ruck, scrum or maul. In the early stages of the siege, the short term goal of the fly off is to select the right players and options to get the ball across the line as far and dominant as possible. Because when you start crossing the line, you start sucking in defenders, along with forcing them to fall back. This commonly results in a defensive formation losing shape as players struggle to reorganize and stretch themselves thinner and thinner to cover the space left by players at the bottom of the ruck and still falling back to get on side. Also, when you get the ball across the gain line, it becomes easier to recycle the ball quicker. If you have seen my video explaining rucks, you may remember me explaining that poachers, cleaners and counter ruckers have to enter the ruck through the gate meaning they have to come from behind the tackle player on the ground and not enter the ruck and break down from the side, which means they have to run further in comparison to enter the ruck legally. So it becomes easier to achieve ruck dominance when you are getting over the gain line effectively. Now, if you start getting quick ruck speed behind the gain line, the problems for defense become exponential as they now also have less time to fall back and reorganize. So the fly will continue the siege until they feel the defensive resistance is weakened enough. Then they will unleash their strike weapons. By getting the ball into the hands of the players that have the skill, speed and agility to make the opposition pay for leaving them so much space to operate in. Now, not all defensive systems are equal. And this is often the biggest area of difference between top teams. A team with good trust, good coaching and disciplined players tend to have a cohesive and confident defensive system. So better defensive systems generally need more patience, more phases of attack and a more tactically astute and skillful fly off to break down than an inferior defensive system would. The more skills a fly off has in their arsenal, the more options the team have available to them to keep the opposition guessing and the more opportunities the team have to find weaknesses in the opposition's armour. A good, accurate pass allows the team the ability to get the ball wide quickly with high risk passes. Even better if the fly-off is equally good off both sides. If the fly-off has an educated boot, the team can play a territorial game and pin the opposition back with accurate kicking. Or could use kicks as an alternative method to get the ball into space fast. And if they are able to kick with both feet, it is harder for their opponents to put pressure on their kicks and easier for them to get a good angle. Very often the fly off is also the main goal kicker, as kicking is a required skill set for a 10, but anyone can kick at goal. A big bonus is a 10 that is a running threat in their own right, whether it be their ability to beat defenders with a step or blow them away with pace. Being able to put pressure on the defensive line with their own running ability makes it a lot easier to set other players up in space and to take advantage of opportunities that present itself. That's because defenders can't just shift off the fly-off and onto the players the ball is being passed to. If the fly-off is a running threat, the defenders have to remain committed to the fly-off, thus taking one or more defenders out of the equation. These are the key skills that all fly-offs have. Some are better at some skills over the other, so you get a good array of different types of fly-offs whose skill levels are all balanced differently. And when your pivot is stronger in some areas than others, the team tends to play according to those strengths, or they pick a fly-off with the right skills for what they want to execute.
On top of this, every fly-off brings a bit of themselves to how the team plays. Every team has to adapt to a new fly-off to some extent, because they bring their own X-factor to a role that influences so much on game day. So their personalities and the way they see the game has a big influence on how the team ends up operating, even if they have to operate under a strict game plan. Some fly-offs are excellent game managers. They play the percentages. They do what is statistically the smartest option in different match situations. They don't take unnecessary risks. They kick for territory rather than run the ball out of their own half. They play set piece to set piece and drive their team forward with an accurate boot. They also tend to favour territory over possession. Then there are fly-offs who are excellent opportunists. They burst X-factor. They play on instinct. They choose to run the ball from anywhere. They are not afraid to run risky plays that require high skill and they value possession over territory. I have just described two hypothetical fly-offs on opposite ends of the profile spectrum. In reality, they all fall somewhere between these two extremes. And this is how the selected fly-off injects their own flavour into the team. Fly-offs are selected on their skill level and tactical abilities ahead of their physical attributes. So you'll find that fly-offs can have a variety of athletic abilities. This is because it is better to have an average athlete with good distribution skills and game management than what it is to have a good athlete with average distribution skills and average game management. The same logic seems to apply to defence. Some teams need to hide their fly-offs in low traffic areas when on defence. Now, don't get me wrong, majority of fly-offs hold their own on defence. But because of the high value placed on having a skillful player in the position, it can happen that teams are willing to select a player who is not the greatest defender. So it is a bit of a cliche in rugby that fly halves are bad defenders, but it is true sometimes, not most of the time. So you will see teams manage fly halves in different ways when defending. Some are good tacklers, they man their own channel and the team runs defence as normal. Or the 10 will fall into the backfield rather than stay in the defensive line. Having the fly off fall back into the backfield, even if they are strong defenders, is still a very good option, as their skill set is perfect to field kicks, execute return kicks, or even set up counter attacks. So the way I make my videos is I would come up with a topic that I would like to teach, and then I would write a script for that topic. And then naturally, the next step is to video the script. Then I would go and look for footage to back up what I have shot and written in the script. I have thought about it and that just really seems to be the easiest way to go about things for me personally. The one drawback to doing it this way is every time I do a video I find footage which I think is good for you guys to see but it doesn't fit into the script or into the video which I've already shot. So this prompted me to come up with this new section for my videos where I add clips at the end of my video which I think are good for you guys to see and I'll take you guys through it with my voice. Okay, great. So let's get into our first clip. This is Great Cooper. He was, is a very talented Australian fly-off. In this clip, he is playing for the Reds based in Brisbane against the Brumbies who are based in Canberra. The footage we are about to go through is the footage that really inspired this new segment. We are about to watch footage with Quade Cooper mic'd up and an extra camera following him around so you can see how he goes about his business outside of what you would normally see on your screen. Now, this is shot with a lot of dramatization but it does not take away from the insight it gives into how fly halves think. And it shows what they do off the ball, because most of their game management happen off the ball. It's their constant communication that keeps the team running cohesively. This clip has a lot of important sound, so I'm not going to speak over it. I'll be freezing like this to jump in and out and add my two cents. Okay, let's get into it. Desperate for a win to try and give their fans something to dream about in 2018. Up over the this is where you can see the camera following Cooper around when he is not on the main screen. I want you to take note of how he is assessing the situation while he is running into position. 
Notice how he is already planning the next phase of attack and making sure his teammates are in position while the current phase of attack is still happening. Once in position, he assesses the defensive line, most likely assessing the numbers and positioning of the opposition, as well as where the slower players are, as he will be looking to match up his faster runners against them. This scan happens very quickly. He then communicates what the plan is through some code words. Then the ball gets recycled out of the ruck. The scrum half then will pass the ball to Cooper and Cooper will distribute the ball to a selected runner for the back line to run the play he called. Okay, ready? Go! <laughs> first try of the night and get back into the contest. Craig Cooper, Hunt, wide ball, Smith, George Smith, inside ball, and the youngster, Amy Stewart has got his first super rugby try. Here's another example of the 10 being the player taking the shots at goal. They are by far the most common position to kick a goal. But it does not have to be the 10. You could search YouTube and probably find footage of every position taking shots at goal. But because of the skill requirement to play 10, by default you would expect your fly off to be able to kick. So they are often entrusted to do the goal kicking. And Craig Cooper from out wide is bringing it around nicely. All of a sudden it's game on, 15-13. In the next section of the clip, you'll see the leadership role a lot of 10s play. A good 10 knows when there are big moments in games. I want you to take note of the conversation between Cooper and Hunt. Hunt is the 15 with the longer curly hair. Take note of how they identify that the Brumbies have been leaving space in the backfield, and this time they're going to take advantage of it. They end up finding the space, and they end up winning excellent field position. Let's go! Momentum, that's it! That's a momentum changer! Let's go! Easy play work, let's go! Hey, get some energy! Hey, let's get them up! The Queensland Reds. Coach. They are trying to end a five-game, three-year drought against the Brumbies. Maybe if they set up top, I'll just play straight to you. You've got Hamish on your outside, so you've got two kicking options. All right? Exactly, but. Smith takes it out of the tunnel. Cooper. Hunt. Puts it onto the toe. And it's in the touch. Hey, Kay. Kay, great work. Kay, that's the play. Good play, Kay. Two and a half remaining. It's uncorked. Van Ray finds Enida. Oh. And they come out. And all of a sudden, the Reds get the foot into the scrum. Okay, so now the forwards have done a great job at winning the ball back. Remember, the back line decided to kick for territory to get back in the Brumbies half. It was up to the forwards to put pressure on the Brumbies line out in order to win the ball back. Generally, when you kick for territory, you want to kick for touch, so that your forwards get the opportunity to get the ball back in the line out, rather than have the opposition run the ball back at you. Notice how he congratulates the forwards on the good work. Then he goes straight to the right winger, number 14, and communicates that he wants him to run off of his inside shoulder, as well as other members of the back line so they know how to position themselves. He has realised something in the defence that he thinks can be exploited by having someone run off his inside shoulder. Now, I can only speculate that he has noticed that the loose forwards are not breaking away quick enough from the scrum to cover the inside channel. This often happens when the scrum is under pressure, but without being able to ask Craig Cooper himself what it is, I can't know for sure. Maybe one day when I have a platform big enough, I can get him to come give some live tutorials so I can ask him to talk us through it himself. Notice how he also says try time when he explains the plan. He is confident he knows how to get through them. Big, great work. Hey, Izzy. Hey, Bob. Are you going to get an inside ball off me? Just go straight hard. I'm going to work out what play is next after this struggle. I'm going to get clean ball. You're going to come flying in short. Uh, for me, I'll get the ball out of the back here. Inside ball to Izzy. Try to Seconds ticking away. Now he has taken his position. 
you'll see him do a final check to make sure everyone else is also in position. Notice how he also turns to the winger, who is going to run off his inside and says, don't get in front of me. This is him making sure the winger is checking the timing of his run and not running too early, because if he does, the pass could go forward. Now you'll see it play out pretty much as Cooper plans, except the winger gets brought down about 5 metres short of the try line. But because he gets so far over the gain line, they are able to get ruck dominance, which puts the Brumbies under a lot of pressure, and it forces them to do something illegal, winning the Reds a penalty and allowing Cooper to slot the winning points. Don't get in front! See my Instagram? Yeah. Hey? Yep. You see my Instagram? Yeah. Go, bro. Go, bro. Sweet, man. Woody boys. <laughs> now, our next clip is a silent clip, so I will be talking over it. It is a clip you have seen before. It is Andre Pollard of the Springboks who will be trying to set up for a drop goal. They are currently positioned in England's 22 and he is going to want to try and get more towards the centre of the field so he can have an easier kick. Notice how he takes the time to make sure all teammates understand what they need to do and they also know what he is about to do. He now does some final checks making sure everyone's in position, checking where the English players are situated, and now he will move into position. Now, I want you to have a look and watch how he, what he does off the ball. Watch how he communicates with the team and how he orchestrates them all into position and how he tells the forwards to keep forming pods and moving closer to the centre of the field. So he wants another one. He says, come, 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 I want another one. There they go. Now, he's going to want a little bit more to the centre. So he asks for another pod, and now he sits back, and now he waits for the scrum half to deliver him the ball. Now, he's not going to do his part. He's going to shank the kick, but you get the idea. Whatever you choose to call this position, first 5'8", first receiver, pivot, fly halves, out halves, there is no argument they are the players with ice in their veins. I like to think of great fly halves as having the calmness of a fighter pilot. When the pressure is on, they seem to operate as if they are playing in the backyard. They make good decisions and they execute accurately no matter what is on the line. They are often the face of teams, the lead singer and the scrum half, the backup vocalist. They show how ineffective brawn can be without direction, tactics, and strategy. They also show how unstoppable it can be when harnessed and controlled by a good pilot and a good game manager. Someone needs to be the star of the show, the one people talk about, the one that brings all the supporting acts together. At the end of the day, you can have the best musicians and the best music writer in the world. But if your conductor is not up to scratch, it won't amount to a great showing. And it's the same with a rugby team. You can have the best coach and the best players. But if your fly-off can't bring it all together on game day, it will count for little and the entire team will struggle to execute. Fly-off is a position where possessing rugby's finest skills is not a novelty, but a basic requirement. 
combined with the importance the position plays in executing team strategy. The 10 position is probably the most scrutinized in the game. Rugby loves a skillful 10. Viewers love a skillful 10. Like the scrum off, they show that rugby is more than pace, size and power but that it also provides us a showman possessing the magic and vision to make the game a joy to watch beyond its physical brutality. Thanks guys. Like, subscribe, comment, buy me a haircut. Bye everyone.